Hello and welcome back to Realistic Progression 1 Kerbal Space Program. We are back at it. It's been quite a bit of time, but we're picking back up. We're rebooting it. And uh, before we do, I do want to say that I'm going to be changing a few things. Um, so what we're going to have in this series is the build up, the design, all that stuff is going to be done live commentary of me going over, explaining, talking about it. And then the launches and the missions are going to be um, post-commentary. Um, and that's because the missions can take quite a bit of time. And really, you only need me talking in live when we're dealing with uh, design, right? As that's you know the major part of the game. So, where did we last leave it? Well, we're currently building... Um, the Alpha 3B RTV-3. After some failed attempts to reach orbit and return a vehicle to the Earth, we are now on the third iteration of the launch vehicle and the, uh, the test vehicle. We need to complete this to obtain enough science to be able to unlock the necessary research to, well, send a human into space. Unfortunately, we are not yet able to do that um, until we complete this mission. So, we're about 45 days off launching this uh, operation uh, with our launch vehicle. And in the meantime, we're also going to be building towards some other very important things. So, that means uh, Lunar Orbiter, which we should be able to, relatively speaking, achieve quite easily. Um, we just need to get some better tech for that. We have a deadline of September 29th, 1961 to worry about. And then also we're going to be working towards the like geostationary satellites, targeted satellites and things that will help with uh, our funding because we need to get as much funding as possible for the end goal of, well, putting a man on the moon. We're currently researching at the moment Orbital Rocketry 1916. We're getting uh, early human material science, which will provide us with better engineer efficiency, as well as crew survivability, which is needed for our basic capsules. We will get 45 science from this mission, so we'll have enough for basic capsules, uh, and that will then allow us to send someone into space. We'll need to select a launch vehicle and launch pad that'll be capable of supporting a human-rated vehicle. But we are not really in that position just yet. In terms of engines, we are going to start to go into a path of which way do we go. We could go for both, but it's expensive to do so. We have 96 to 1 orbital rocketry. This middle line is very much your... You know, regular stock engines of um, gas generators, Kerolox, that kind of thing, right? Non-stage combustion, but not Hydrolox either. Hydrolox line has your very efficient, very good vacuum engines uh, using Hydrolox as its fuel source. And oxidizer, of course. And then you have um, Oxygen Rich Stage Combustion, or ORSC. Oxygen Rich Stage Combustion is going to be a potentially a very good thing, but it really comes down to what do you want more, LEO payload or uh, deep space payload. Uh, LEO payload can be really, really valuable if you use it right, but I think we're probably going to follow the Hydrolox route at least initially um, before we get you know, down to here. So, let's time warp to building that rocket, um, and uh, hopefully we'll have a successful launch. Roll out to the pad, and let's launch it. And we're going into our post-commentary now. And we're here with the post-commentary for our launch of our RTV-1. Now, uh, something that I do make a mistake of before we go ahead with the launch is uh, I believe that we have more science to collect with this vehicle. We actually don't. Um, but we do have a contract we do need to complete, which will be important to actually be able to get the new contracts for um, crewed orbit, uh, for putting a human into space. So, launch going ahead pretty successfully here with a very high thrust to weight ratio. So we're right off the pad and we're going straight through the sound barrier. Um, and going under maximum aerodynamic pressure, otherwise known as Q, uh, which is uh, the, the amount of uh, pressure we're dealing with at the peak or thickest part of the atmosphere while being at the peak of our, our speed, and those kind of intersect and create uh, you know, those effects that we just saw there and that maximum pressure. But it really mellows out quickly, and we're approaching the point at which we're going to be jettisoning our two side boosters with those RD-107s uh, in about five seconds. 
they drop off very cleanly and we're continuing on our ascent. Now the thing with this rocket is I actually, the, there's a pretty decent upgrade path with it which is why I really like using these Soviet engines, um, early Soviet engines, because you can stick new upper stages on, you can stick new side boosters and it really allows you to you know, use the same uh, uh, capability, same technology, same tooling on these rockets and not have to sacrifice too much. But here we go with the second stage ignition, or third stage ignition, my bad, uh, about to ignite. So that's our RD0105 with ignition, and we're away. So this is a very long burning engine. It burns for 400 plus seconds, but we are going to be burning much shorter here because the payload is quite light. This rocket entirety could lift a payload of four tons into low Earth orbit, which is a pretty decent payload fraction. It's about... Uh, 2.7, 2.6% payload fraction, which for an early 50s rocket or, or mid 50s is pretty damn good when you think about it, really. But yeah, the engine's doing very good, and we're going to be approaching 7700 meters per second, which is orbital velocity. Um, and once we have reached orbit, we're going to be jet or detaching our uh, recovery pod, and with that detached, we are then going to uh, stay in orbit for a little bit deorbit the vehicle and re-enter over the atmosphere because again the contract calls for reaching orbit and then returning safely back to earth we in fact even do get some science from returning something from orbit which we haven't yet done so we just need to return home safely now so we're going to get into a position where we can point retrograde and fire those thrusters we put at the top of the vehicle uh, on top of the probe and those will uh, deorbit the craft and take it from a circular orbit down to something like 20 kilometers by 200 kilometers which will intersect with the atmosphere and allow us to re-enter pretty easily so here we go with that burn so we're burning those three large thrusters at the top and as you can see here our periapsis height at the top left top of the screen um, is going ahead and burning uh, go going down rapidly Let's stop about 20 kilometers and then we're going to time warp to the point where we can start our descent. Now this is going to take quite a bit of time, um, so we've got to keep that in mind. I hope you guys haven't been enjoying uh, the content. Uh, I am planning to release more RP1 content as I do really love the game. Um, so if you guys do you know, want to see more of it, remember to leave a comment, like, subscribe and help support the channel. So we're beginning our descent. Vertical speed is about minus 103 meters per second, which means we lose, you know, a thousand meters per second every 10 seconds. So we're just time warping through this. And of course, this footage is sped up 2x as well. So it's like eight times time warp, really, um, as we descend across the, I think it's the Indian Ocean. Yeah, we're, we're moving across the Indian Ocean towards Australia. Um, and we should have a pretty quick descent here and uh, you may notice why the heat shield is so big this is because we don't want the edges of the capsule to be caught in the um, heat or, or, the, or the I guess you call it a jet stream but the stream of, of that you're kind of breaking through the atmosphere right you create a shock cone that you, as you crash through the atmosphere and all that friction builds up around the heat shield and that's where we want it to be staying we want that heat and that uh, energy to be kept around the heat shield which ablates away and uh, ensures survival as you can see here our ablator is depleting and then you know our charred uh, heat shield is increasing um, and we actually I, I was concerned here that we were going to blow up uh, but luckily that doesn't happen and uh, we managed to rapidly slow ourselves down uh, then we have this weird behavior where I jettison while time warping and we have the heat shield intersect with the vehicle, which is a bit annoying. But the heat shield finds its way out and uh, we jettison the top of the vehicle and uh, prepare to... Well, we arm the chute. And so now from here, we're going to descend to five kilometers and then the chutes will open and then we will slowly drop at four meters per second into the uh, ocean. And that will be a successful mission for our first flight for today. Um, of course, it does always take a bit of time with those shoots because you are going 4 meters per second, which means it takes, you know, uh, almost 25 seconds to actually drop 100 meters around there. Uh, but we are able to do so, and we drop right on in. Boom. 
and we complete the mission successfully as well. Do have some issues with the bouncing waves actually recovering the vehicle, but we uh, we we managed to make it work out either way. So I'll see you guys next time, or not next time. I'll see you guys in the main commentary. Okay, and with our successful mission, we didn't get the science as you may see. We've already gotten that. I must have uh, forgotten, but we did return ourselves from orbit successfully. We could do another uh, one of those for more confidence. Uh, we've also obviously got our orbital test flight, so that is going to be a uncrewed test flight of a capsule with no crew on board. Very, very important. And we also have the suborbital test flight. And finally, lunar orbiter. So I think the next imperative for us is figuring out lunar orbiter capability. In the meantime, though, we're going to research basic capsules. And the first thing that we're immediately going to do is we're going to hire some astronauts. Well, we can only afford one. Uh, no, we can afford more. We can have some subsidy. Uh, we'll hire... I can't really hire these people. They're not pilots. Well, it looks like Remy Lambert is going to be the uh, the lucky, lucky person to be sent up on our capsule. So we're going to put them into training. We're going to get... Uh, our vehicle ready to go for what we will be doing now the planned capsule I'll be using is the mercury capsule famously used on mercury redstone mercury atlas and was the United States first ever um, capsule able to go into space um, successfully and return humans so we don't really need the same amount of payload otherwise because this rocket, as you may know, can carry quite the payload. If we check conventional tanks and we turn on dry mass, we can affirm exactly how much payload we can actually carry. We're going to put on avgas. I like using avgas for this. Go rid of that. And then we can increase the size. So this can carry, you know, about a, a four-ish ton payload. Okay, four tons. We need probably 1.4 tons. So what I'm going to do is we're going to take the vehicle. We're going to bring it up a little bit. Because it needs to be nice and snug into here. We're going to strip away the side boosters because they're no longer needed. Because the payload requirements are much reduced and they only add cost. We're going to check the amount of payload we can actually get from this. So we can achieve a total of around 1.4 tons with a decent SLT. However, we are a little bit under the margins I would appropriately want. Uh, I mean, this is pretty good, of course, uh, dealing with payload. But we have about the rocket we want, right? Uh, you know, single stick. Only about 70 tons. Um, if we check our launch complexes we have available to us, uh, we have a 135 to 180 ton LC-3. We're going to need to build ourselves a LC-3A, uh, and we need to human rate that. Um, and that human rating is going to be extremely important, because otherwise we can't launch our planned rocket. The other thing that I'm going to do is we're going to take our RD-105, and we're going to get, we will be switching it for the RD-0109, which should have much better reliability uh, comparatively. Um, and that reliability is going to be really, really important, considering the fact that we're going to be putting humans on it. Let me just uh, sort this pipe out. It was bugging me while I was watching the, uh, the launch. There we go. Yep, that pipe looks good. So we're going to adjust also this. So we want to go for 2.5. We're going to go for a square sized we're going to then strip away this payload area we're going to put in our planned capsule so we're going to be using the mercury capsule here now there is a bit of a discrepancy between the diameter of the stick or the rocket and the diameter of the capsule um, as you can see here so what we will need to do is create an adapter for this but first let's put together our mercury capsule great Great support for the Mercury capsule in terms of modding support. So what we're going to have now, um, we're going to have now, let's put the rest of the Mercury bits on. So a heat shield, we're going to need that. Uh, next, we're going to need the uh, landing and control unit on top, and then the uh, MD cam nose unit, followed by the destabilizing or, or stabilizer, uh, yeah, destabilizing flap on top. 
And then finally, we're going to put the launch escape system as well in case anything goes wrong. We're going to follow this up by putting in the retro pack, which is going to be needed to deorbit the vehicle. And then we will need the uh, retro rockets. So if I go over. Oh, I must need the solid rocket. Um, I need the uh, solid rocket motors before I can do that. So that's going to take some research, of course. But let's go for a uh, decoupler there. We're then going to put in a hollow uh, adapter. So this will go here and we will have it attached like so. Give me a hollow cone. We're going to bring it out towards the primary adapter. And then we're going to have it tapered down into the rocket. So we're going to do that. And we can actually probably do something a bit like this to give it some additional uh, additional space. So with that, we kind of have our vehicle assembled. We do need, obviously, the solid rockets, but we have the Mercury capsule on top exactly where I want it. Um, in fact, what I'm going to do is we're going to do it. We're going to paint it white. Um, I quite like white as the uh, as the color. Unfortunately, we can't paint the uh, LAS white as well. But it kind of all matches a quite uniformed look, which is uh, you know, exactly exactly as I want it. Okay, so with that done, we're then going to add ourselves a launch escape tower, not launch escape tower, a crew uh, tower, uh, because we're going to need it. So if we go over to here, we should be able to find a Mercury tower. We have the crew elevator for Gemini, which we will eventually get to. Um, it really depends, though, on the kind of vehicle I'm going to be looking at assembling for the Plan 2 crew missions. Uh, so let's go over to here. These are Titan launches. Okay, these are the Mercury ones. So Mercury, Redstone with the hatch. So we're going to bring this forward. Oh, actually, it should be on the other side, shouldn't it? it down I'm just gonna have it there because that's what we would use ah it doesn't really fit does it because the issue is the uh, launch tower but it's fine how it is so we're gonna call this um let's let's use a, a, a different a different name um mercury one of course was this name uh let's call this terror one so we're gonna call this terror one get that ready to go it's gonna it's relatively cheap cost only 5700 cheaper than the launch of one of the bigger vehicles we're gonna build lc3a and we're gonna human rate that we're gonna make sure that actually the vehicle can actually get into orbit so rd108 correct bring this down Get us in the launch escape tower and then the couple that. Okay, everything looking good on that regard. So, new LC, LC2, LC3, A. Human rated build that launch complex. And that will take 250 days, which should be about in time for when the training completes. Um, a, little much, a little bit quicker than when the training completes for actually putting the astronaut in the capsule and sending him off into space. We can before we do that though, we could that we could send uh uncrewed flights, uh, which obviously is gonna be uh, something that we probably want to look at doing. Let me just check our finances. Okay, finances work completely fine. What I do want to now check, however, um is going to be what I want to check, however, is going to be the uh lunar orbiter, right? Because we need we need more science. And the most accessible science we have is either landing or orbiting the moon. And so we have a mission for orbiting the moon. So that's what we're going to try and accomplish. Now we have our L, uh, Alpha 3B RTV3, uh, right? And what we want to tell or what we want to see is how much payload we can actually send to the moon. The issue is, of course, is if we look at our current lunar rocket. So, Luna 3, 
we have the payload capacity to send, you know, that to the moon. That's not really enough. Uh, we need to send something much, much bigger. But before we can do that, let's keep our four ton thing in mind. So four tons is what we can put into low Earth orbit, which means we have that much to actually you know, send something to the moon. So we're going to start with is a avionics core. We're going to create a, let's do a polygon, okay? We're going to make a polygon. We're going to make this a deep space, which means it'll be able to control itself uh, in near the, near the moon. And we're going to probably look at about 300 kilogram payload. Let's do something like that. We then have also have solar panels. Um, and what we're going to do probably is do something like this. We want to provide it with enough solar that it will be able to stay in orbit for at least a month, ideally. Um, this may not always be, you know, viable to have a workout, but it is going to be important, uh, if, if, if we can do it, because otherwise, um, it's not going to be lasting very long in orbit, that's for sure. Let's do this. We're going to increase the width a little bit, and then we're going to spring it, bring them in like that. And then bring everything out. Okay, there we go. So we have ourselves solar panels. Now, those solar panels should provide a lot of EC needed. That is, of course, going to cost quite a bit. But, you know, we're not doing this on, the, on a short budget, are we? What do we have access to? Do we have access to small thrusters? Not seemingly just yet, but that's not something that's going to be a problem. What we're then going to attach underneath is a small pod, uh, or, or a small kind of retro uh, pod, that will hold both the fuel, uh, so we want to go for a high pressure alloy stringer tank, and also the RCS thrusters. So we're going to have on here four RCS thrusters. Scale them, you scale them down, like that. And then do four-way. Uh, we could use yeah something like this would work pretty well. Yeah, do something like that. That works pretty well. So that will be our control system. That will control the vehicle. And then finally, we need something to actually put it into orbit. Now, to orbit the moon in a low orbit, which is what they want, we're going to need about 800 uh, meters per second of delta V. Um... That is quite a bit, and the real only way I think we're going to be able to achieve that is probably going to either be um, RCS thrust or uh, solid rocket motor. So I don't think we're going to be able to uh, do that until we have some new research, specifically new research in regards to solid rocket motors or flight control systems. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to go check our R&D lab. We need to research the solid rocket motors um, to get up to 1959 to get the retro rocket. This is important if we're going to actually make the vehicle work. Otherwise, we'll have to design a new retro system for the Mercury vehicle. Terror, that is. And we're going to need flight control. Now, early flight control we will have access to in a relatively short time. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and we're going to go and get that researched. We also have a lot of funds coming in, actually, and so we're going to make sure that we actually have those researchers doing what we need. We're making a lot of money, um, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to upgrade our R&D lab. I'm going to make sure that our... Uh, I don't think we need the mission control upgraded. I would like to get the tracking station up, up, upgraded, but we can't really make that work. But we're going to get the research and development on the way because we will need to scale that harder. So let's go get our orbital rocketry, which is good. And then we're going to go for our early flight control, which is going to be you know, the second most important thing here. We're now entering 1960 as well. So we're going to accept the contract for putting a probe in the orbit of the moon. And again, we want to keep that probe there for hopefully at least a month with the necessary science and uh, you know, all of that stuff. Because if we're skimming the moon, we can image the moon, we can, we can do science. There's a lot that we can, we can make work there. So... Now, we're going to add ourselves the little thruster. So, what I mean by this, we're going to add ourselves the 200 
275 to 445 kilonewton thruster. We're going to add in high tester peroxide as its fuel source. Bring it up, and uh, this is going to provide us with the majority of our delta V. So we're going to add in the HTP, um, and we're going to also change these to HTP. Um, but we are, this is a bit of an issue in terms of the uh, delta V needed here. Um, what is the mass of this vehicle? That's quite heavy, isn't it? Um, yeah, I'm not sure what I can do to get away from that. I think we are going to need a salt rocket motor for this. Um, and so a baby sergeant could be a good a good call here. Uh, though it's still only 180 meters per second, we need something ideally a lot more powerful than that. Uh, a three cluster gets us 500 meters per second, but this, that's not that's not a lot. Um, so I think we're going to have to really overburden this with a lot of RCS fuel um, if we're going to make this work. So let's go ahead and check the yeah, EC's fine. We're going to have to add in a lot more fuel. We're probably going to need yeah hundreds of kilograms of additional fuel to really make this work. So what we're going to have to do is bring out this tank like that and we're talking yeah something like this and that's like a 500 kilogram payload that's quite a lot of work to make work like that um could we use something else i mean that's 400 meters per second but that's not very efficient in doing its job what about if we have the better version here i mean that gets us 152 meters per second with that 300, we need to reach, what's the orbit they want? Yeah, we need to have a pretty low orbit around the moon. And uh, that's going to require, again, a lot of delta V. So something that I'm going to do then is we're going to change out the tank to use an integral tank or an isogrid tank. Because that will allow some serious weight savings that we're going to need to actually make the vehicle work. So let's go ahead and grab the RCS, grab the thruster, add in the HDP, uh, HDP. So that gives us 600 meters per second of delta V, um, which is pretty nice. How much to get ourselves to about 800? Not that much. Let's do that. That's a 900 second burn time. Now, luckily for us, RCS burns well forever. This can work, I think. We're going to, we are going to increase the scale of the RCS a little bit. And then we're going to embed the thruster and color this as white. Do that. And I'm also going to color this as white as well. So that gets us about 800 meters per second. That'll take a thousand seconds to burn, which is, you know, significant, but nothing that can't be overcome thanks to the reliability of the RCS thruster. We have enough. Um, control we have enough power so with that in mind we have our orbiter the only thing that we do need to add now is science as well as communication capability so we're going to add that on top and then i'm going to add in the necessary science capability so let's go ahead and configure so what we want on this is a barometer thermometer as well as a, ha uh, a visible imaging sensor. And the reason that we want these and not some of the longer ones is that they will provide us with... They will provide us with science across all of the biomes, which is, again, the goal here, um, you know, ideally, right? So 700 meters per second. This should be enough. 393 kilograms. Let's make sure that we are at the right control mass. We want to be at 400 kilograms of control mass. And that is our probe, ladies and gentlemen. That's what we're going to be using to orbit the moon. So we've got our solar system uh, set up here. We have our uh, control uh, system down here. And we have our communication system. Um, something that I might actually do. We could put like a code on here. But I think we'll leave it as that. So now you may ask, okay, how are we going to send this thing to the moon? Well, we're going to need ourselves a translunar injection stage. Because it's 400 kilograms, this means that we now have 3.6 tons to play with to send this to the moon. So we need to, we have we can put a payload of 3.6 tons plus this and hopefully send it to the moon, as stated. So uh, we're going to set up 
little interstage. Like that. That provides us with that little interstage. We're then going to add in a avionics core. Because we now have enough payload to be able to actually use an avionics core here. Let's go for a kind of cone shaped uh, configure. Yeah, we want about 3.6 tons. Good. Then we're going to add in an isogrid tank because every bit of payload at this, you know, at this size, right? At this you know, capability is going to be really, really important. So we're going to do so. And then we're going to add in the planned engine. Now, I'm going to use the RD0105. I could also use the 119, but we're not going to use the 119. Um, I'm going to use the 105 instead because it's you know, compact enough uh, that you will be able to work within the needed uh, space, right? So 1.7 tons, we need 3200 meters per second of delta V, so we're going to go ahead and do, yeah. 3200 meters per second of delta V. We are going to add, I'm going to add some additional margin on the delta V because um, the fact is that we will be lingering in orbit um, for probably a little bit of time. So it's actually going to be quite a lot less weight than I previously expected. Um, so we're going to add in 5000 RCS, uh, not RCS, but 5000 EC. We're going to add in our additional, our own. Um, our own uh, HDP because we don't want to make, you know, we don't want to have uh, used this RCS fuel. And then we can increase the tank slightly. And that gets us to, we'll do about 3300 meters a second just to give us some margin. 2.3 tons gets us exactly what I want. And so this is going to be the translunar injection stage we're going to make work. Uh, I can also change this out for the RD106, which does have a, or 0106, which does have some delta V benefits and also reliability benefits, both of which are very, very, very important. So we're going to call this LO plus TLI. And then we're going to grab our rocket. So in this case, it's going to be the Luna 5. We're going to grab the rocket. I'm going to attach it thusly. So let's go ahead and it up so get rid of this move this down and then we're going to put this under we are going to need probably a new fairing for this i would imagine yep we are so we're going to go ahead and we're going to increase the size of the fairing to four meters it should be enough for the fairing size we're we are going to upgrade the engine on the second stage to the rd0106 and then we're going to make sure we're tooled to the correct part. Bring it up. Like that. And then we're going to reattach the fairing halves. There we go. Fairing halves reattached. Engine good to go on that regard. And we're also going to resort out this area. So we're going to call... this up a little bit okay we're going to call this the alpha 3bl which is for lunar operation we're going to make sure that we can if we can upgrade our engine so we can upgrade the rd107s so that's what we're going to do to the newest variant this should get reliability up even further that's what will have happen when the tool the rocket and then we're going to launch it as soon as we can. So let's go for building. Uh, size limits. Oh, the height's a little bit too much. So we're going to have to um, upgrade uh, the pad or the uh, launch complex before we can actually launch that rocket because the height parameters are a bit of an issue. However, that rocket should hopefully achieve us that lunar orbit we were looking for. Um, and it'll only take 13 days to sort out the launch complex to accommodate the additional height. And then we're going to build ourselves the rocket. Uh, we're going to build a backup as well in case the rocket does have some issues. Um, which it may very well do. And also um, if we need to launch a second lunar orbiter uh, for whatever reason. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to build. I'm going to build another one. 
And uh, that's going to be our next mission to do. Okay, with that now done, we're going to be assign reassigning our staff. So let's go ahead with that. I'm going to hire a few more staff people to make sure that's working. We're going to have our research and development complex finish up. We actually want to get a deficit, are we? Um, at least not now we are uh, with that launch, with the new research complex. Okay, rocket is ready to go. Let's wall it out. And we'll cover flight and proceed. So this is hopefully going to put ourselves on orbit of the moon. <laughs> Let's hope it works. I'll see you guys in the post commentary. And we're going ahead with our second launch for the day. This is our lunar orbiter launch. Again, pretty standard first launch sequence. High thrust to weight ratio rocket ascending into the atmosphere at 200 by 200. We set up by setting our launch to the target plane, which is where we want to be launching towards. Make sure my staging is correct. And we time warp so that we are launching at the right time on the planet Earth so that we can actually intersect with the moon. So we launch up and we're very quick at that. Um, again, very high thrust to weight ratio rocket. This is because we're only using two boosters and our core is actually pretty light. Um, it's something that we can definitely stretch and upgrade in the future, but it's you know it's not something that I, I think about too too much. So with the boosters about to drop off, very nice, and uh, we're continuing our ascent as we can here. Quick, very, it's very quick ascent because I'm time warping through this and also 2x speed on top. We drop away those fairings, and as you can see, all of that you know TLI stage is sitting right there. So our third stage is going to take that fourth stage and fifth stage into uh, orbit. Um, and then once we're on orbit, we're going to separate that TLI stage. It's going to use its own nav uh, own propulsion and navigation to get to the right area and then ignite its own RD0106 engine, which is what we upgraded the 105s to uh, recently. And then we also obviously have our probe. So we're nearly done with our ascent. Um, and then we'll be setting up a path to actually intersect uh, with to actually intersect with the moon, which is going to require a Hoffman transfer, a relatively low energy one, which is actually good for us because we want um, the amount of uh, delta V to actually enter an orbit to be quite low. So we decouple, and uh, unfortunately our RCS doesn't initiate immediately, so I have to manually uh, activate our uh, propulsion RCS so that we can actually maneuver. And then we set up a bipulsive Hoffman transfer. Now we want the transfer not to be an impact. We want to just be above the Earth, uh, or not above the Earth, but above the Moon with our transfer, so that that so that we can initiate our orbital insertion at that periapsis, as you can see on screen. So I'm trying to get to about 110 kilometers, 100 kilometers, um, ideally. Uh, and of course, it's been a bit fin finicky because we're so far away from the moon that any small correction is going to have a significantly higher impact than you otherwise might think. So we get ready to fire towards the node. Um, and again, it's going to be a very quick burning high thrust to weight ratio RD 0106. Now, the engine has very high ISP, so it's definitely one of these things of... Uh, uh, built for the job, though, because of how much thrust it's actually providing, it's very, very thrust intensive. So we begin our translunar injection, and so far, so good. That extra reliability paying off in dividends. I remember the first initial launches with the reliability issues of sending probes to the moon, but no such reliability issues were, uh, you know, bringing their ugly heads out. Um, and within about 40 seconds, we'll have cut off of that engine, and we can detach the probe which will then be able to adjust its trajectory and eventually go to the moon and begin its orbital insertion. There we go and we have well before most of the transfer we just need to kind of do some little trimming with our RCS to get into the exact transfer we wanted which we managed to do. We're then going to separate the probe, which happens, though the force of the decoupler actually means that we need to adjust again with the onboard probe RCS. And we successfully do so. We're going to extend our antenna out and we're going to begin our transferring over towards uh, the moon. 
I check our EC, we are actually charging just fine with our uh, solar panels, which is good, means it's worked. And after about a three and a half day journey, we arrive at the moon. Um, and we're going to get ready to circularize. Now, what I am going to do here, which I do have some issues in achieving, is we're going to be doing multiple burns, three-ish burns, over the time. So we're going to do our initial burn to insert into a high orbit, then a medium orbit, and then a low orbit. Um, this is to gain the benefit of the moon's oberth factor, um, or ob oberth effect, which basically means the closer you are to a gravitational body, um, the bigger kind of you know uh, additional boost you get to deceleration or acceleration um and this means that you know uh, if you were for example raising your orbit from your apparatus which is away from the planet compared to raising your apparatus below the planet or, or, or you know, on its periapsis you would see that the periapsis uh, raised maneuver will require less delta v than otherwise so we're going to try and take advantage of that of course the moon is a lot smaller than earth uh which does mean that it's uh not as much of a big an effect the larger the gravitational body is the more that has um for example jupiter you can do some insane gravity assists and and, and stuff like that because of its um massive gravitational uh field um, around the jupiter itself it's such a big and large body so we enter an orbit and we enter an initial orbit and then with that I'm going to cut off the engine and we're going to do another burn coming up here soon. Uh, we're going to be able to actually enter a relatively low orbit here which I was really happy with um, and so we're going to be able to accomplish exactly our objectives. Um, again we want a low orbit because we're able to gather science and then also because of our contract which is going to be important for our progression and completing our next on our lunar program. Because the next thing after doing this is going to be landing probes on the moon, uh, actually landing them. And that is going to require, obviously, a lot of effort to achieve. So we're setting up the burns. I do some over time warps here, which is a bit of a problem. But it does show that our solar panels and our communication system is working, um, which is you know, good to see, right? Um, you know, exactly what you want to see, ideally. So we get ready for our secondary burn. About 250 meters second of burn. And it's going to take us to eight minutes-ish. We begin our deceleration, burning in our retrograde, and that's bringing our orbit down significantly, and that's going to get us to a about a thousand uh well not a thousand kilometers but about five thousand kilometers and then we're going to bring it down further um with the third burn which will bring it down to about a thousand kilometers on the apparatus and then we're also going to actually lower our periapsis to have more time in low uh space around the moon um you can be safe above the moon uh, 30 kilometers above um, anything lower there's a risk of obviously hitting mountains um, which the moon does have, or at the edge of craters, basically like big dips in elevation, um, which you can call mountains, of course. But with that now done, we're going to go ahead and go for our third burn, which will lower us even more. That's another 320 meters second of delta V we're going to have to accomplish. And we're going to get ourselves into a, quite a circular orbit here. Um, and we actually do complete, in the meantime, our lunar orbiter contract for first lunar orbiter. So we complete that about a year ahead of where we originally said uh, we would, of course. Burning through all that lovely fuel and uh, our apparatus is dropping rapidly down towards the moon's surface. I'm also going to drop, as I said, the periapsis, uh, which we managed to do. Drop that to probably about 50 kilometers, something like that. I was having some issues with the science. I think they changed it. Um, I'm going to have to look into that. Uh, but it's not too big of a deal. And we do get some science from this. They're not as much as I wanted to. They might have nerfed the um, science you can collect here. Um, though there are definitely things like that mass spectrometer and some of the stuff that can really generate a lot of um, science. Uh, which, of course, we would want to be able to do. 
So with our orbit now set up correctly, our uh, probe can pretty much remain here um, practically indefinitely, uh, though not indefinitely because the solar panels will wear out, of course. Um, that is just a fact, of, uh, a fact of life, sadly. However, it's going to be able to run in orbit for long enough that that's all that matters. So let's get back into the primary commentary, uh, and I'll see you guys in a little bit. We've successfully reached orbit of the moon, and with that orbit successful, uh, we are going to be able to uh, move on. And uh, I'm going to see you guys in the next episode, where we'll continue and maybe even land on the moon and send probes further out. You guys have a good one. Goodbye.